Hey, gang, this week's episode is brought to you by our pals at NordVPN, celebrating a birthday this month. Hey, get a uh, free gift and a free month when you order a two-year plan at NordVPN.com slash GoodSeats and use the promo code GoodSeats. Yes, that's NordVPN.com slash GoodSeats, promo code GoodSeats for your free month and free gift when you order a two-year plan. Now, here's our show. October 1972 will go down in the annals of sports history as the year when a modern-day miracle occurred. Twelve brand-new, fully manned, well-balanced Canadian and American hockey teams took to the ice and began thawing out the first ice age and opened up a closed shop that had become one of sports' most firmly locked-up monopolies. The impenetrable fortress that had withstood years of onslaught had finally met its match. It was the dawn of a new era brought about by a group of modern-day visionaries who saw a vital need and dedicated themselves to filling it. They did it with top-draw athletes, playing the kind of hockey that's exciting and vibrant. And in the years ahead, they will introduce hockey to hundreds of thousands of fans who otherwise would never have had the opportunity to see a live professional hockey game. The month of October was the culmination of months of bitter battles, fought in strange arenas, with even stranger weapons. And once again, the pen proved mightier than the sword. And the winners are the sports fans of today, and the generations of future hockey fans no longer have to wait for something to happen to a present-day hockey season ticket holder before they can put in a bid to see a game of professional shinny. It's a new, meaningful chapter in the history of hockey, and the sports world has become that much richer for it. This is only the beginning. It's a brand new ball game, and this new breed of club owner is dedicated to giving the hockey fan the keenest competition, excitement, and best entertainment in the world. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey now, everybody. How are you? It's uh, your pal, Tim. We're back again. Yes, it's another week of fun and frivolity on good seats still available. The curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Thanks for finding us. Uh, If you're new to the proceedings, thanks for uh, for doing so. And uh, we welcome you. Uh, And uh, if you are a return visitor, well, welcome to you as well. Uh, however you have found us, we hope that you're subscribing to our, our feed, uh, and whatever the little podcast uh, app that you choose to use, uh, you bookmark our little website at goodseatsstillavailable.com and, and, and just envelop yourself into all things defunct and forgotten and previously domiciled. That's what we like to obsess about on this show. And, uh, case in point is another return uh, visit to the wacky world of the world hockey association. Yes. Uh, a topic that we've delved into. Uh, quite a bit in previous episodes. Uh, the New England slash uh, uh, Hartford Whalers uh, with our pal Howard Baldwin uh, was an example of uh, sort of going micro. We go macro, uh, and we've had a great conversation with uh, our pal Dennis Murphy, uh, one of the co-founders of the WHA, along with Gary Davidson and, and some others. Uh, we sort of writ large, uh, if you will, on the WHA. And we're going to kind of stay in the realm of umbrella and writ large this week with our uh, our new pal, Scott Surgent. Now, if you're a student at Arizona State University uh, and in the math department, my guess is that you know Scott Surgent by his day job, which is uh, as a calculus instructor slash professor. And uh, that is, uh, you know, that's sort of the uh, career sort of path. But the passion project uh, by night, by weekend, by uh, holidays uh, and all other sort of nooks and crannies of time when he can find it has been uh, an adult lifelong passion for the World Hockey Association. And Scott, uh, for a number of years, uh, has been the author uh, and, uh, and, and an ongoing revisor, if you will, of uh, a phenomenal book that uh, must be in your Forgotten Sports uh, library. Uh, it is now called The Complete World Hockey Association, 11th edition. Yeah, if you can believe it. 
Uh, it came out, uh, the 11th edition came out in the fall of 2018. But I, as I record this this week, I am holding uh, what uh, Scott admits later in our conversation is, is admittedly a collector's item. It was then known as the Complete Historical and Statistical Reference to the World Hockey Association uh, back in 1995. And it is, uh, at the time, it was 400 and some odd pages. It's now well over 500, almost 600 pages. And it is the definitive book that has every single stinking stat that you can imagine that's been lovingly corralled over the years and, and, and revised and edited and updated. And if you consider yourself a hockey fan generally, or you remember the WHA and you don't have this book, or by the way, it's sister publication uh, called the World Hockey Association Fact Book. There's the second edition of that that came out in 2015 uh, by our guest this week, Scott Surgent. Shame on you. And of course, uh, you can find copies of it through our website at goodseatstillavailable.com. Just search up this episode number 204, and you'll find a convenient link to Amazon to get it, and you'll uh, be sending a few shekels of of uh, referral love our way by doing so. But this is the uh, the book to have and to uh, regale in, revel in, whatever you want to do, just roll around in, because it is endlessly fascinating. I mean, it goes on around – it's not just statistics about the players – uh, it's attendance stuff. It's a media, uh, radio, television stuff, uh, various anecdotal stories, um, all co- league uh, records, uh, interleague records with competitions with NHL teams and, and various players that played in both leagues. And all co- it goes on and on. I'm not doing it any justice. But in our conversation coming up, you're going to sort of hear uh, how sort of Scott uh, uh, sort of stumbled into this passion project of his. Uh, what keeps him going, still doing it, uh, the people he's met along the way, uh, the recognition that he's been getting from various uh, players and administrators and officials and uh, and fans and all that kind of stuff. It, it's just it's a great conversation that uh, you WHA hockey fans will uh, will uh, enjoy to no end. And it's coming up in just a few moments time. Uh, it's our conversation with Scott Surgent. And uh, it's it's delightful. Uh, and the book, of course, is uh, more than that as well. Uh, let's see. How about uh, a couple of uh, 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 sponsors this week that uh, just kind of can uh, help scratch that WAH, uh, WHA itch, he says, uh, that you might have. And uh, what better way to celebrate uh, the World Hockey Association than by visiting, uh, let's say, three of these uh, great sponsors of ours who all have fantastic WHA collections. Uh, let's start with our pals at Streaker Sports, streakersports.com. Promo code for you there is good seats for 15% off all of your purchases. Uh, and at Streaker Sports, uh, among the various other uh, leagues and uh, and sports culture stuff that they've got, there is a just absolutely gorgeous and handsome World Hockey Association t-shirt, t-shirt collection. Having a tough time speaking today. I apologize for that. Uh, but uh, I have no apologies for stuff like the Baltimore Blades or Uh, the San Diego Mariners or the Calgary Cowboys or perhaps the Denver Spurs and and literally every other team that ever played in the World Hockey Association uh, in these great uh, T-shirt forms. Uh, You will find those at streakersports.com. And promo code GOODSEATS, just fantastic collection. Uh, Visit there early and often. You'll love it. Now, when you're done there, you want to hop on over to 503 Sports. That's 503 dash sports.com they call themselves the king of throwbacks promo code for you there is seats and that's 10 percent off all of your purchases not only will you find t-shirts and stuff there but you'll find and hoodies and all that kind of stuff and caps and you'll find though uh tremendous one-of-a-kind uh handcrafted and uh, uh painstakingly researched jerseys uh quebec nordiques houston arrows all gorgeous new england whalers uh, gorgeous purple uh, and white and black and and uh, gray Cleveland Crusaders, all these great jerseys, Phoenix Roadrunner, uh, just great stuff. Great, great jerseys. Uh, you can customize them with numbers and your name on the back. Uh, they're truly one of a kind. And again, it's 503-sports.com. Promo code SEATS, 10% off all of your purchases there. And last, but certainly not least, our pals at OldSchoolShirts.com. And that's OldSchoolShirts.com. Promo code for you there is good seats. 10% off all of your purchases there, and you're going to find another uh, tremendous collection, lots of different colors, actually, uh, for uh, all of your WHA uh, shirt needs. There are a couple of different versions of some of those um, of some of those teams. So, for example, the, um, the Indianapolis Racers uh, shirt 
uh, is actually uh, not just only the logo, but uh, their longtime um, slogan, Positive Waves, all in sort of a great logo kind of form. Uh, the Jersey Knights shirt uh, for their one-ish year in uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, has a little Cherry Hill Arena uh, memory uh, uh, attached to it. Um, those are all there for you, too. And again, that's at uh, oldschoolshirts.com, promo code Good Seats. And we thank all of those great folks for commemorating the WHA, supporting this show, and uh, bringing you uh, and helping support uh, the delivery of a great interview like this one coming at you right now. Here's our chat with Scott Surgent. We had it just a couple of uh, days ab- uh, ago. And let's talk WHA hockey, shall we? Please, as always, enjoy. You know, for me, it was uh, quite a treat to actually find you because I'm literally sitting uh, at my desk uh, yeah. as we record this with the original, uh, almost mint condition, by the way. I've done a very good job of keeping good uh, uh, for twenty eight ninety five from Zaylor Press, the original yeah. complete historical and statistical reference to the World Hockey Association, written, researched, compiled, and edited by Scott Adam Surgent. And um, that's a collector's uh, item. It, well, a collector's item, but it's also, look, this is... Uh, there have been many revisions, and I was uh, happy to for, discover the fact uh, that it, that's been the case. And I guess that's because people are just continually fascinated by the the World Hockey Association. So well, let's get started. What, where? Sure. What's your adjunct to this WHA thing? Like, how do you, how does this cross your radar in your life? Started out as well, you know, as a young teenager in the late seventies, and. I was following, I was living in Southern California in the LA area and I followed the Kings. And uh, so quickly I was able to figure out the NHL and what the teams were and who the main players were. But the WHA standings would sometimes be printed in the paper, but there would be nothing else. And so I was curious about this league. And I knew enough to know that certain players like Bobby Hull and Gordy Howe played in the WHA, but I could not understand why they were there and not in the NHL. And there was absolutely no context. I just did not understand the WHA's existence back then, but you know, I was way too young to do anything about it and couldn't just look it up on the internet in 1978. So I waited. And frankly, it wasn't until many years later that, you know, by the nineties, uh, I got, my interest was rekindled and I started researching the, the, the WHA really just to kind of pass some time and just for my own amusement. But I quickly discovered a lot of really good information out there and the thing just, you know, caught fire. And uh, I quickly realized I have enough here to potentially make a book. Um, so, so so you're an agate guy in this case, just like me, right? You're, you're not in a market per se of the WHA at the time, uh, no. you being West coast, me being East coast, but you're aware of it, right? How, how do you, yes. how are you aware of it? I mean, like, how does it, you know, like, do you just, you just pour well, over the sports pages like I did and just, just stumbled across it or, or pretty much. What? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'd spend an hour or two every morning just looking at the LA times sports section. I mean, I read everything. I, I even read the fishing report. Um, but yeah, they, they would occasionally print standings for the WHA and every once in a while mention an article, usually about Bobby Hull or Gordie Howe or something like that, or when something significant happened, um, uh, when Gretzky first came along, but that was it. And again, there was no context. There was really no follow-up. So I'd get these little snippets and it was just something that kind of stuck in my mind. Uh, to be honest with you, once the leagues merged, I pretty much forgot about it. And it wasn't until years later, again, you know, probably talking 10 more years that I realized there is a lot of history here. A lot of the best players in the NHL, you know, say 89, 90, were WHA graduates, not only Gretzky and Messier, but guys like Gartner, uh, Goulet, uh, Ramage, um, Mark Howe. And I thought that it, it just, it seemed like there was this portion of hockey history that was just simply buried. And so I got, I got interested in it, but again, there was really not much you could find on it. Even in early 90, 91, you know, you were pretty much limited to what the bookstore sold. So, again, uh, in 93, it would have been the end of 93, I started researching it. And 
I, I just, it, it started out very humbly. I thought I would last maybe a day or two before I gave up, but what, what's, what's so Scott, what's spurring you to do this at that, that time and that moment, something that well, just, it, it's, I came across a very beat up copy of the 7475 Xander Hollander pocket guide. Do you remember those? All right. So Xander Hollander is kind of like a, a, a somewhat of a patron saint for, for, for this, for this little show, right? Because yeah. the, this is a guy who, um, and I, I honestly don't know if he's still around. I, I, I plead ignorance. Um, and if he is, I, I, I'm sure he's got some great stories to tell. Uh, or if he isn't, he certainly did. But this is the guy who essentially was sort of the, uh, how could you describe him, sort of the um, compiler, I guess, or the sort of uh, uh, annual almanac kind of guy. Who yes, was, that's was, a good was, way of putting it. Uh, an almanac. All kinds of sports, not just hockey, and, and but but also the North American Soccer League and and all that stuff. Right? It was sort of mm-hmm. the, it was almost like the aggreg- the agate aggregator, so to speak, and and adding stories that once a year you can kind of actually put some context around. Yeah. So, I. I happened upon the 7475 and terribly beat up. It was missing its cover. Pages were missing, but it had the WHA portion fairly complete. And it was the first time that I had ever seen anything extensive on the WHA in any form. I, there were teams I didn't even, wasn't even aware of. So this is 7475. So, um, I, you know, the Vancouver Blazers, I don't even think I was even aware they existed until I saw that guy. And I saw all these players, uh, thumbnails and articles written by Ren Davis of the Winnipeg Free Press. And I just thought it was fascinating. And now I wouldn't say that was the one thing that got me, you know, to study the league again and and build it from scratch, but it was a start. It was just something that I thought, well, if, if there's no book out there, well, maybe I'll put together one. And so when does, I never thought I'd get this far, but I did. So, all right. So, so when does it go from a uh, curiosity and, you know, uh, a little flight of fancy and, and a little bit of exploration and tip over into rabbit hole slash obsession territory? Pretty quickly. Um, what I did is I started by reading old microfilms of the New York Times. And I started with the 72, 73 season. I figured I'd just go from the day one. And my plan was to just go through each day, look at the scores, look at the articles, and just start basically writing down the scores, just basically a big log of who played, what day, and what the score was. And But in doing so, because the Raiders were, were in existence at the time, the New York Times actually gave the league pretty good coverage. About once a week, there would be a feature article. And so I saved all those. And that, that served as an excellent kind of starting point to develop a book out of that. And I would say probably after about really just no, no more than a week, I, I was, you could say I was down the rabbit hole. And yeah, but that's, it's interesting you chose the New York Times because it was, you mentioned the New York Raiders and then they sort of became the Golden Blades and uh-huh. the Jer- the Jersey thing and, and all that kind of sort of stuff. But but then, yeah, that was only, that was really short lived, right? And it, it's interesting that the New uh-huh. York Times would be, I could see because, it was one of the charter franchises, right? When the, mm-hmm. when it started, you'd sort of had that, but, but I'm guessing that wasn't your go-to source as the, as the years went on with this league. No, no. And really I, I you know, I started the, the public library in Mesa, Arizona. So you can imagine I was, I didn't have access to any of the Canadian papers. Um, and the New York times was the only periodical that went back to the early seventies. Now, they, of course the Arizona Republic, which is the main Phoenix paper, they had copies of that, but they would not have covered the WHA in 72. Uh, as things progressed, yes, I, I was able to expand outwards. I started going to the other libraries in Phoenix, um, the ASU library, um, and I was able to find a lot of good resources. For example, the, the Phoenix Public Library had sporting news issues going back to early 74, uh, all the way through sometime in the 80s. So I was able to get the sporting news issues fairly complete. And then um, and I just basically pieced it together. Uh, the Chicago, uh, uh, Chicago Sun Times paper, or the Chicago Tribune, was another go-to source. So I was limited to the American papers because, again, I was doing this from Phoenix, Arizona. 
And, but during, I would say, the 90, 1994, I was aggressively looking around periodicals and I was finding dealers that sold, say, uh, media guides or uh, old issues of the hockey news. And so over a period of about a year, a year and a half, I, I collected quite a bit of material through these dealers. Um, at the time, I never had, again, I just never had regular access to, say, the Toronto or the Winnipeg or Vancouver papers, something that would have been really helpful. And I never had access to a complete, uh, complete set of the, the hockey news. So I, I somehow pieced it together. Um, what, one stroke of luck that I had was in, I want to say, the end of 94, I found a fellow here in, in Glendale, Arizona, who had a near complete set of media guides for all the WHA teams. And so I was able to use those guides along with what I had found in the newspapers and other periodicals to reasonably assemble the contents you see in the first book. I knew that it was not complete, even though the title said so. But at some point, I had to put the book out there, and my hunch was that I would be hearing from, if people bought the book in the first place, I would be hearing from potential fans, and maybe they could fill in some holes. And that's exactly what happened. That, okay, so let's also put this in context. This is not your day job, right? This is, what no. is your career? And this is obviously a diversion from that, I'm guessing, right? Yes. At the time, my day job, I didn't have a day job. I was actually just teaching part-time at the community colleges in, in, around, in and around the Phoenix area. Um, in the summer of 94, I was hired on to teach at Arizona State University. And I have been there ever since. So, yes, that became my day job. But no, this is purely for fun and diversion. I, I, I enjoyed the research. Uh, it was fascinating to me. It was always, every day I was finding something new and interesting. Um, and from, I enjoyed it for my own sake. I, you know, I, I still had no sense or confidence I'd actually get a book put together. Uh, and if one did, I had no sense that people would actually want to buy it. So my feeling was I'm just going to give it my best shot and see what happens. If, if 10 people bought the book and that was it, well, that would have been fine with me um, because I was doing this for my, to satisfy my own curiosity. But it also feels to me that this is uh, there's a void that you have recognized uh, during this process, right? That there yeah. is no uh, source to go to for whatever reasons, because it came and went or people lost interest or, uh, you know, you, you're looks like you were sort of almost on a mission. It's almost beyond sort of, intrigue with this league it's almost like you uh, were trying to maybe will this sort of uh i don't know uh this omission i guess in the reference shells for this league yeah and i was kind of surprised that there was no nobody had put together anything previously um and i did look and, and but i had never saw anything that was published in the 70s or i'm sorry the late 70s early 80s mid 80s that would have covered the wha the closest would have been the uh the Stan Fischler uh, Hockey Encyclopedia that came out in 82, I think, or 83. And that had WHA stats. But, and I did use that as, as a source, but I quickly learned that it wasn't very complete. It, it missed a lot of players, had a lot of players misspelled, little things like that. Um, at some point, I realized that it, it's, it's going to be me. I guess nobody else is going to do this. And I also it always bothered me when statistics don't add up and when there's errors like that. And so one of the, the, one of my directives was to get the player stats as correct as possible to include everybody. Um, I didn't want this just to be another, another book about Bobby Hall or Gordy Howe. I wanted it to be a book about every single player that played in the WHA, even guys that played a single game. Um, so I wanted it to be almost like a reference source as opposed to just a, a you know, a book about exciting plays in hockey that Gordy, Gordy Howard, Bobby Hull made. I wanted to be really uh, cover all the teams, all the players, and, and really just show that there's this fascinating aspect of hockey history that just hasn't been properly covered to that point. So it, this feels to me like you're trying to establish a base first with uh -huh. as much as you can do comprehensively for statistics, right? And then right. what then build upon that in terms of, Yes. Stories and narratives and, and, and uh, other yes. intrigue and stuff, but, but stats first. Uh, it was originally going to be a stats. And, and when I started formulating the idea for the, 
the structure of the book, I was kind of thinking like the media guides that you would see for a team. So it would be player thumbnails, their yearly statistics, and then, you know, the play, the seasonal results, the, uh, the, 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 uh, splits, one loss tie record home and away, stuff like that. I figured that alone could make a book. It wouldn't be very interesting. It'd just be a bunch of numbers, but at least it would get the stats taken care of. Um, but yes, I realized I needed a narrative too. I needed to give some, give, put a framework around all the statistics. So that's, I started researching that too. I, I was really trying to find who, who, who dreamed this league up. Who are these guys? Why, why, why did they even build a hockey league in the first place? And, um, and, and that became a project unto itself. So the stats part was actually done fairly quickly. I would say it took about five or six months, but I, I had the stats part pretty much nailed down, uh, about five or six months into the project. It took about another five or six months to really start getting the narrative put down, figuring out the actual history, trying to find resources. Um, and, and then it took a few more months of just putting it all together. Uh, and, and one of the interesting things was, is I was always finding new things as I was working on the book. So I would, I would get the book to a point where I was happy with it. And then suddenly I'd find a couple more interesting resources and want to put that material in. So it, was, it felt like I was never going to finish. And, and I, and I came to a point where I, I felt, I felt like I was stuck. I needed to get, put the book out. And again, as I said earlier, I think that I knew that some people would probably reply to me and say, Hey, you know, I've got some information here about this part that you're missing. And um, they would send me the information. And, and I've in the, in the front part of my book, I've tried to list most of the people who have sent me material over the years. And I know I'm, I'm missing a few, but I want to thank those people extremely for their helpfulness because some people gave me lots of information. Some people would just give me like a single sheet that showed a player number. And I thought, well, this is fantastic. You just can't find this stuff. It's not on the internet. It's not going to be found at a flea market. Some guy had it in his attic and he was kind enough to go find it and send me a picture of it. And, and that's been one of the most satisfying parts of the project since the first book came out back in 95. All right. So in March 95, the book comes out. Who, who, huh? Uh, how how does it go out? I got you, how do you how well, do you publicize it? And then I'm really intrigued as to who uh, some of the some of the characters that contact you first. Well, I I I I, I realized and I I guess naivete more so than anything that it probably wasn't going to be picked up by a big publisher. So I knew I was probably going to have to do this by myself. So I started researching on how to self-publish and I decided, well, okay, I can do this. Um, they, you know, how to get an ISBN, uh, how to market, things like that. And so I found a, a, a printer and a binder. And I, if I recall, they were in Ohio and I basically just paid them the money to print up a, I think at the time it was 500 copies. And then I just started advertising in the hockey news and I, I had the ad and there was a little ad in the, in the, in the uh, uh, classifieds. It was just WHA fans, you know, big new book on the WHA contact. So, and so, and I gave a phone number and, and at two, a couple of things happened concurrently. There was a couple of uh, people who took their, took my book on as part of their hockey book inventory. And the, this was when the internet was really not a thing. It was just barely coming online at this point. So, most of it was done through mail order and boy, it's been so many years, but um, they told, they were getting a lot of requests for sales and they told me the book is really selling really well. And I was getting, I had a mail, a PO box and I was getting a lot of orders you know, a lot relatively speaking, but I sold out those 500 copies in about five months, five or six months. So by the su- end of summer of 95, uh, I, <laughs> I was so surprised I sold 500 copies. I, I thought I would sell 10 or 15. I, I realized the timing might've been just right because in 93, 94, 95, this would have been, you know, 15 years after the WHA ceased. However, its legacy was living on in the, in the form of players like Gretzky and Messier and Gartner and Goulet and, and all the fantastic other players that were big stars in the NHL at this time. And, I think there was just enough, you know, it was recent enough where people remembered it, but it was still, it was far enough back in history where it was starting to become a little fuzzy. And I think a lot of people were 
appreciative to see a book on the WHA um, in, in any form because really it, there was nothing out there. I, I'll be the first to admit I was surprised that there was nothing else out there. And I'll be also admit that I was surprised my book did as well as it did. Uh, again, I'm very humbled and appreciative of everybody who's purchased a copy over the years. How much did this uh, morph into uh, once people started kind of weighing in, buying the books, uh, uh, maybe correcting you or, or mm-hmm. adding pieces or filling in gaps and all that kind of stuff? And by the way, it's actually quite prescient of you in that, you know, you, you recognize that even you're getting this first edition out, it's, uh, you know, at least maybe, you know, uh, hopeful, right? You're saying complete in, uh, mm-hmm. in the title, right? Uh, but but you already know that going out the door that, you know, literally it seems like almost up right to the last minute, you're still getting new pieces and there's lots of yeah. stuff sort of hanging out there. Uh, you know, it's admirable that you recognize that <sighs> you're, you're putting something out there that you know is nowhere near going to be complete. And it's almost anticipates this is going to take a village at some point yeah. to kind of really tell the full you well, know, dramatic story here. I could have waited 10 more years to get it truly complete, but I think, I think there came a point I needed to pull the plug or, or, Fisher cut bait, as they say. I needed to do something. And it, it, I'll admit it was a bit of a gamble. But sure enough, uh, a fair number of people contacted me. And they gave me a lot of useful information. And so that became a theme for a number of years where the I would get some information. And about every two or three years, I'd do, I'd do a new edition. And then on my own research I'd find more updated information um, so I've added to the book over the years uh, and so even even as recently as just in the last few years I still get a bit, bits and pieces from fans that, that add to the book and now admittedly the, having the internet has been helpful I've been able to track down for example uh, uh, complete the sport, uh, sporting news issues and, and other uh, places through some of these like newspapers.com, for example. Um, so I've been able to kind of fill in my own blanks. It, it, it's, but uh, during those, I would say for about the first five, six, seven years after the book came out, uh, I was getting fairly consistently information from uh, fans who were helpful and you know, sent me some stuff. So yes, it, it really was kind of a, a, a village that, built, that wrote the book. And I even write, write that not, uh, in my uh, forward where I basically say, you know, it's a book by everybody. I'm just the guy that types it up. And and what did you expect from those folks kind of writing in and, and contacting you and stuff? Were you, were you expecting to be yelled at for getting stuff wrong? Was it, did you, no, actually they were quite, what did you think, did you think were, about this league going into this and put it birthing this into the world? Because I actually, actually learned quite a bit since this process. I, they, they were very helpful. They were, they were appreciative. Um, yeah, I made some errors in the first book. I got some, uh, players misidentified. Um, I got some stats wrong. Of course I made some typos, uh, but they were very helpful. Uh, they, I think they realized this is something that's useful to hockey fans in general. And so I was always appreciative when, when people would send me information that, that either corrected a mistake or, or filled in a blank. As time has gone on, you know, I still get a lot of good feedback. I, I do think that the, the, I think I'm just going to postulate that I think that a lot of the fans want to see the WHA at least remembered and not completely forgotten, especially fans of the league, uh, people who grew up with a team in the WHA. And I've often wondered, you know, I grew up following the Kings, their NHL, and they're probably not going to go anywhere for a while. But I followed them and still do very closely. And I can imagine how, how rotten that would feel if your team just suddenly goes away. And that's exactly what happened in the WHA, except for the teams that moved on into the NHL. So there were a lot of very serious fans, you know, fans of the old Minnesota Fighting Saints, fans of the old New York, New York Raiders, for that matter. Uh, you name an early team, there were a lot of very, very rabid fans. And they were often the ones that were most helpful. So I never got a really a negative response. And one thing I want to add is that I did actually have players contact me and, and they were always very, very grateful. They, they were just happy to see a book out on the WHA. And these were guys like uh, I would call the goaltender Jim Park, who played for Indianapolis. Uh, I had a nice talk with him on the phone for about five minutes one day. 
And he was just a real nice guy. He was just happy to see a book that had been published on the WHA and, you know, complimented me. And I, and I was thankful for his feedback. And that's the kind of thing that I, I always felt was really exciting. You know, I'll, I haven't gotten rich doing this, so I've, I've, it's an extraordinarily enjoyable experience. Yeah, I mean, we we had um, uh, sadly the late Tim Gasson uh, as one of our early um, yeah. guests, right? The uh, WHA Hall of Fame, right? And uh, yeah. uh, you know that idea, at least, uh, not physically located anywhere per se, but you know, in video, right? That uh, was a big uh-huh. source of his life, and 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 the archives and all that, kind of, and the, the website and all that. And it's, um, it, but it is not only is it a labor of love, but it does. I think you you kind of just keep discovering layer after layer and story mm-hmm. after story. I mean, you know, we, we've had some amazing guests on this, you know, for this little universe of, of, of oddness on this show. Um, you know, people like John Sterling, for example, right. You know, mm-hmm. well-known broadcaster, you know, Yankees for at least 30 years now. And mm-hmm. you know, was a sports talk guy, but you know, few people remember that he was uh, he was the, basically the chief cook and bottle washer when it came to media rights for this, this, whatever this New York Raiders f- franchise yep. was, this is a guy who literally, you know, went, went to Madison square garden and, and, and car, you know, cobbled out a, a radio deal. We, we didn't even know what he was doing um, exactly. as well as being the voice of that team. And, and uh, cause you didn't know any better and it was a gig and it was, you know, it was uh, New York city broadcast time, right. Uh, yep. Fascinating. We've had Dennis Murphy on this show, right. I mean, uh-huh. you know, this is the guy who, you know, we've learned and I'm sure you kind of figured this out relatively quickly, right. A lot of the WHA, uh, at least in the, in the early going, yeah, maybe even the late going too, was about getting franchises sold and and you know we'll fill in the players and the stats and the the, the arenas right. later, right? Yep, um, yep. At what point did you sort of when did the story kind of start to to hit you? Like did the stats start telling you stories? Did you see themes in all of this? Did it take a couple of issues and editions of the book for that to come out or, or first people to reach out to you? Like when did the story start to kind of gel? Oh, fairly early on. I, it, again, it, it's an enormous amount of information to process. So the stories were kind of, they kind of existed independently until I could start piecing them together more cohesively. And to use an analogy, it's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. You get one part put together and maybe another part, Put together and you still have this jumble of separate pieces but over time you start to connect them and all of a sudden the, the the little islands start to connect up into a big unified piece um going back to the my initial research uh with using the new york times they usually did a feature piece about once a week on the wha and it might be something on gary davidson it might be something on um a player uh, you know, Bobby Sheehan, for example. And I would just print those out and I would save them. And because these were just good, uh, highly localized into, uh, bits of information that maybe not might not be useful to me right at the moment, but I knew it was going to be useful later on. And so over time, when I felt that I had a pretty good understanding, at least a, uh, an outline of, of the history and the motivations behind the WHA, then I could start putting together a more cohesive narrative. Um, and again, there's no point where it went from nothing to something. It, it just kind of developed over time. But going back to the earliest days, I was sensing that I better save these articles. These are going to be useful to me. Did you have any um, sort of uh, pet projects or, or special unique interests in all of this? I mean, you're, you're, you're a guy who's growing up and, and living in the Phoenix area with the roadrunners, like a particular interest or was well, the, was the, the non-existence of the Miami screaming Eagles, uh, something that you, you know, was sort of your, like, were there any, or were there any, uh, 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 uh Holy grail, so to speak, like, uh, just uh, things that were completely puzzling that you just couldn't figure out the answer to. And somehow they fell into place. I, I'm just curious as to like, which, which sort of threads of this uh, of this league kind of was most intriguing to you personally, if any? I would, for me, it was more of a general nature. For example, why, why were some of the teams that were ostensibly good teams with good management, why did they fail? For example, why did the Minnesota team fail? You would think that a, a team up in Minnesota would do well, even though they were going up against the North Stars. But at the time, the North Stars were not a very good team. The Fighting Saints were a good team. They were a far more interesting team. Uh, I would have thought that that team would have been the one that beat out the North uh, the North Stars for for uh, to survive, 
And so I was always curious, why did some of these teams just go away? Why, why did why did Vancouver not persist? Why did Calgary go away? And as I, and, and to, you know, in, in my research, some, some of the case answers were really obvious uh, or, or they, they came quickly. So, for example, in the Minnesota case, uh, basically the investors pulled out. Basically, they, they, there was no money. Um, they were doing a lot of they were doing a lot of it on, uh, you know, hope the money comes in in the future. They, they, they had a good team. They had good players. But I think they had overextended themselves pretty quickly. So that one was pretty easy to solve. But one of them that really just always perplexed me, even up until, I would say, the last 10 years, was the fate of the Calgary team. I never could find a, a single piece that says Calgary has folded. I never found a little newspaper snippet or anything. I had to piece this together. I was able to go through the Calgary papers. This is obviously much more recently to find, basically narrow it down to when that team went out. And even then, even in, the, uh, in, this, in those newspaper pieces, they weren't, they never said Calgary is folding, Calgary is going out of business. They were always saying something like, Calgary is on hiatus. They're going to, for example, in the 77, uh, I think, well, it was what, it was August? I mean, the dates are a little fuzzy, but I think it was in early August when they had the first NHL WHA expansion vote to see if the, they were going to absorb the WHA. And Calgary still was, quote, in business up to that point, but in the barest sense of the word, I'm not really sure what they were intending to do, whether they were going to maybe – stay quiet for a year and then come back after a couple of years, who knows? But that was one case where I can never pin that one down. And up until fairly recently, and even then, it's really just a matter of surrounding it with evidence to infer the conclusion. Uh, they were, they basically stayed in existence up through the uh, NHL WHA merger um, vote in August of 77. After that, I think they just simply quietly went away. But, you know, if somebody has a piece, a newspaper article that says Calgary has formally folded. I would love to see it. Well, so so you're mentioning it's the Calgary Cowboys, not to be confused, yes. by the way, with the originally envisioned oh, the, the, Cal- the Bronx Calgary Broncos, right, 1972, yes. which never played. But you know, you're 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 picking one sort of um, uh, historical lineage of, of a team. I mean, I it. All of these teams, uh, the ones that lasted but had various parts of call, uh, just seem to be just one stranger than the other. I, this may be, though, you may have picked one that was probably the most uh, head-scratching because they started their lives, these Calgary Cowboys, as the Miami Screaming Eagles, which never mm-hmm. actually played. And then they became the Philadelphia Blazers. And then, of course, after two years, they moved to Vancouver, like, I mean, mm-hmm. almost diametrically across the continent. Yep. Uh, to you know, for a couple of years, and and we're, we're making some making some uh, some uh, some progress, especially around say the um, the seventy four uh, summit series uh, made a right. start. Um, a previous conversation we've had, and then to go to Calgary after that, right? Um, it just it just gives is evidence of just how nuts, right? The, this keeping enough franchises going in markets that were either naive enough or or, or desperate enough to have pro hockey um it's just it's, it's wild and and it doesn't surprise mm-hmm. me right that part of that wildness is is not getting a full hard stop period end of sentence and paragraph and turn the page on right. the franchise's death <laughs> yeah and it, even the the case of the houston franchise um what you know their, their last few months in existence was quite interesting and and uh you know Timing is everything. You know, Calgary certainly is a great hockey town, but they did not have a large enough rink in the late seventies to support a team because at the time there was no television deals. Uh, you didn't have also this corporate money coming in. It was basically what you made at the gate. And so they were playing at the old saddle dome and oh, I'm sorry, the old, uh, uh, stampede corral. And, uh, they were, they were an interesting team. Um, you know, they, they, they had some good players, and it's unfortunate they didn't survive, but had they basically been able to gut it out for another two or three years, they might have somehow survived. I don't think there was any, quote, bad hockey town in the mix. I think in every single case it was something to do with the, the economy of the era. You know, the 70s were, were a mixed bag of, 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 you know, with inflation and all that. So it was just not a good time to, 
for teams in general, even in the NHL, they were suffering. Um, but in the WHA, they didn't have that cushion that the NHL had. You know, they, they didn't have the wealth necessarily to withstand a few lean years. And also, they're, I think they may, they may have made an error in expanding a little too quickly because you get that initial influx of, of money, but that only lasts so long. And um, I, it's just my opinion. I always felt that the WHA trimmed down to, say, 10 teams early on. They might have had a better chance of lasting longer. Um, but that's just my opinion. Um, I, 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 nobody knows the future. I, I'm sure at the time they thought that certain places were a great bet. They turned out not to be. Um, I, I don't, you know, if you would ask a, a hockey fan in 1973, which teams are going to survive to make the NHL, I bet you they would have said Houston and Minnesota uh, because those were extremely strong teams at the time. Uh, I don't think anybody would have said Edmonton. Edmonton's a great town, but the team was really struggling in those early mid seventies. And there was a point in 76 where they almost went out of business. It wasn't until Pocklington came aboard that the team finally had some stability. Um, so, you know, they were, they were really flying by the seat of their pants those first few years. And, and what looked stable wasn't stable. And then finally you had some people with money come in and give the league some stability toward the end. And of course, you know, they, they eventually merged with the NHL. All right, what's this? NordVPN. Ah, welcome back, NordVPN, and happy birthday to you while we're at it. Uh, it is uh, absolutely essential these days uh, as you're traveling, whether it's down the street, uh, down the road, or maybe even across the globe uh, if and when that occurs again. Wherever you're traveling and uh, you have laptop or mobile device in hand, uh, it is absolutely crucial uh, that you have the protection that a virtual private network affords you so that you can ensure that when you're logging in and checking your email or whatever at a Starbucks or in a hotel lobby or hell, your friend's house or wherever, uh, that your data is not stolen or compromised. And it is easy to do these days. Uh, and the benefits of a VPN are numerous for sure. And NordVPN is absolutely, uh, without question in my mind, uh, the best virtual private network offering that's out there. Uh, and uh, to celebrate NordVPN's birthday, uh, they and we have a special offer for you. You order a two-year plan from NordVPN uh, at nordvpn.com slash goodseats and using the promo code goodseats, you're going to get a free extra month just for doing so, as well as a free gift. Now, I don't know what that free gift is. I'm assuming it's going to be good. Uh, and I will tell you that the service that NordVPN offers is absolutely tremendous. They've got super fast servers. I think over 5,000 of them now in nearly 60 countries. You want to access your Netflix and favorite entertainment websites uh, from abroad or uh, elsewhere, uh, with uh, the protection to make sure that your user information is not stolen, VPNs are going to help, and NordVPN is the best way to do it. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee. Uh, if you're traveling in an airport or a coffee shop, uh, it's tremendous protection. Uh, it is uh, probably the fastest connection that I've seen of any of the uh, uh, the, the VPNs that are out there. And I will tell you, I, it is it's basically flawless. They've got servers uh, in Europe, in Africa, in South America, in Canada, all over the place, 24-7 customer support. Uh, you can uh, load up uh, to six simultaneous connections, uh, and it's double data encrypted for increased anonymity. And it works on all the platforms, whether it's Windows, Mac OS, Linux, uh, iOS, Android, you name it. Uh, it's got just about everything you would ever want, and then some. Uh, in the realm of a virtual private network. That's NordVPN. And again, make sure you uh, use our promo code when you go to nordvpn.com slash goodseats and use the promo code goodseats and you will get for their birthday greetings a free month of service when you order a two-year plan and a free birthday gift. Again, nordvpn.com slash goodseats, promo code goodseats. Thank you to NordVPN and happiest and healthiest of birthdays to you. And now, back to our show. One of the things we uh, we talked about with our various guests that talked about w WHA hockey memories and, and either first person or, or, or historical has been um, 
And I think I asked Dennis this, this question too. Uh, and it, it, this was almost about blueprint, same with the ABA in some respects mm-hmm. as well. And then some of the other challenger leagues is sort of this uh, uh, twin desire yet conflict, I guess, uh, to uh, place franchises uh, not only in uh, fertile new uh, expansionary territories that say the uh, the you know the the traditional league either has ignored or or has been reticent to to expand into or or has just been you know shied away from. Plus, though, being in major markets directly competitive with the NHL, like a Chicago or a Los Angeles mm-hmm. or New York, to be at least major enough to be in those quote unquote major league cities. Right. So, Correct. but it's, 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 you can see though, and this is obviously hindsight 2020, that seems like a real divergence of focus, right? Because can you be both at the same time? And it seems like time and time again, and maybe almost personified by the WHA that that can be a real conundrum because uh, you're mentioning things like places like Edmonton and, and Winnipeg. And these are all places that, you know, uh, have strong hockey cultures and, and would make terrific NHL uh, franchise ultimately wound up becoming. But then, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you survive in the international amphitheater in Chicago, right? Against you the can. mighty Blackhawks, whether they're, they're doing well or not. Right. The Cougars, exactly. you know, <laughs> it was comical their the ability for the, and they lasted longer than I think most people in Chicago ever thought they would. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I can see the conundrum. They, they have to have, they felt they had to have teams in the major markets, i.e. New York, uh, Chicago, Los Angeles, to have any chance of a television contract. Um, really for the same reason the NHL expanded out West. You know, I, I don't think the teams fail in those cities because there was just this, this natural NHL dominance. I think there were many factors. Uh, for example, in Chicago, the, the Horizon Arena, which was supposed to be completed in what, 74, was delayed until 80. Suppose that arena had been built out in time for the Cougars. It could have worked. You know, they, they, there could potentially be two teams in Chicago. Suppose the Islanders had never come into existence. What if it was just the Rangers and the Raiders in New York City? Um, you stick the Raiders out, say, in the, in the suburbs or in New Jersey, that could have worked out. Actually, I think the Islanders, the Islanders actually came into existence faster than they were supposed to because of the show. Exactly. No, be showing up in New York. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's that's been well documented. Had there not been a WHA threat, there would not have been an Islanders and a Flames expansion in 72. Um, The the Islanders are are here purely to to cut off WHA off at the pass, so to speak. so suppose that suppose that the NHL had not expanded in '72 and just left the Raiders to fight it out with the Rangers. I can see it working out potentially if there's a good arena to play in, and uh, you know you you, you leave the Raider, uh, I'm sorry the Rangers to the New, Central New York, and you give the suburbs go for the Raiders, or or you put them in Northern New Jersey, which was a great idea even in '72. They just didn't have a rink available yet. Um, in, in L.A., you know, putting the Sharks out at the sports arena was not a bad idea. The Kings weren't a very good team at the time. Um, there had been the L.A. Blades of the Western League that played at the sports arena, um, and there was still a lot of sentiment for, to, for, the, uh, for the old Blades that had the Sharks handle it correctly. They could have been a potential force. Um, early on, you know, okay, maybe about a year into the existence of the league, the Sharks were looking to move into San Diego. Well, that, that was a viable place for a potential hockey team. Um, and again, you know, hindsight is 2020. We, nobody knew this exactly in 73, 74, 75. But, um, you know, these teams failed, I think, because obviously, you know, lack of overall funds, but also a little bit of bad luck. Uh, I, I, I think the, the Cougars could have gotten a foothold in Chicago, for example, had the horizon been built sooner and uh, giving the team a chance to really develop. Uh, There was just no way that team was going to survive at the amphitheater. That was just not a hockey ready arena. I don't think any sports franchise could have survived the amphitheater. No, no, that was only supposed to be a one year deal, maybe two. And, you know, again, the same deal with uh, Calgary. How is the Cowboys going to survive at the the, uh, corral? It's a great arena, but it's too small for professional hockey. 
you might remember the Flames moved there in what was it, 1980, and they had to play at the Corral, if I'm not mistaken, for about a year or two. It, um, but at that point, the the Saddle Dome was going to be built, and so they could withstand those those first few years. So, you know, suppose the WHA had come along five years later and played into the early 80s. Maybe it would have worked out differently. Maybe there would have been more teams that survived. Maybe there would have been a more viable league. When you look back uh, at all of the teams that sort of, you know, uh, created this sort of colorful tableau of the WHA, there are any teams that, um, and again, this is more in hindsight, right? You never, you never actually went to a game, did you? No, I didn't. No, yeah. I was... I was 12 years old when the league went out of business. But that's interesting how that fascination still carries you through. It, it, yeah. Are there any teams that, that came to life for you that you just either, I don't know, for, uh, accepting maybe Phoenix because they were your home team, or maybe this is the answer. Well, is, is there a team that you sort of adopted or, or found to be sort of just so intriguing that you almost, you know, found it uh, almost as a standout that uh, you almost had a sort of a, a special place in your heart for, so to speak. And again, not having seen any of these teams. Honestly, no. Uh, I like <laughs> them all equally. Okay. Um, but yeah, as I did my research, it was really interesting to see how the individual teams were, were accepted by their, their, their cities. And it, it, that was really interesting. Now I'll, I didn't move to Phoenix until the early nineties. So I actually grew up in Southern California throughout the eighties. And now, in the early mid '90s, there was the Phoenix Roadrunners of the IHL, and there was still some holdover WHA fans. You'd go to a game and you would see some players, uh, not players, uh, fans wearing like a an old Robbie Fatorik uh, jersey from obviously the mid '70s, and you could talk to a, a hockey fan, and they might say, "Oh yeah, I remember when Gary Kurt was tending goal here," and they, they'd say, "Bring up a player." And this was now 18, 20 years later, um, so. I can't say I, I really adopted any particular team as as a, as a team that I you know followed, if you will. Or, I, but in the research, I I I found it all equally fascinating. Um, just to see how the the various cities adopted their teams. I, I'll, I'll go so far as to say is that that every single city that had a team was, loved their team. Uh, I don't think there was a city that outright rejected their team. Um, in, invariably when the teams couldn't survive, it had to do with finances and politics and things like that. Um, but there was no one city that just simply dismissed their team outright. That, okay. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll check that. The Denver case was, was kind of a sad situation, but I, I believe that was because it was rushed. Uh, Denver is certainly a good hockey town. Even in 70, uh, 75, it was a, a good hockey town, but they pretty much placed a team there within a matter of months. And, uh, that probably was an error on the part of the league to not uh, to just put a team there as quickly as they did. But even then the Denver, Denver is a good hockey town. Um, But to put the Spurs there as they did at the time was poorly done. Yeah. We we talked with Terry Fry, longtime columnist and sports writer in the, in the Denver area about that uh, topic, because that actually had something to do with the NHL's Mm -hmm. uh, rustling of possibly uh, bailing out on Kansas city and maybe moving to Denver and the Spurs mm-hmm. were in a minor league franchise uh, prior. And uh, it was sort of, sort of uh, shenanigans, I guess, trying to, yeah. who to, you know, it was almost like a chess game, right? Not on, not on like the, the Islanders situation in New exactly. York between these two leagues yet. And in some respects, some argue uh, maybe quite rightly that the Spurs uh, uh, move up, so to speak, or at least move uh, uh, sideways, if you will, from, minor league status to the WHA almost uh, poisoned the well a bit for uh, when the NHL finally came in with the uh, Colorado Rockies. Uh, it, right. it was kind of rocky, right? They did stick mm-hmm. around for a bit, but uh, it certainly didn't uh, establish uh, for, for all that long. No, it, that was the one case where they, they probably handled it as about as badly as you could handle a situation like that. Um, there had been, you know, there was there was supposed to be a 76 expansion in the NHL. It was supposed to be Den, uh, uh, Denver and Seattle, if I'm not mistaken. And that expansion was was pulled back, uh, uh, I want to say late 74, early 75. So suddenly the, the Denver fans who were excited about having an NHL team are discovering they're not going to get one. The owner was a guy named Ivan Mullenix, and 
he uh, was going to own the, 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 the NHL team that was supposed to be in Denver. So he took on the WHA. Uh, and again, I don't know what his motivations were. I think he may have felt, well, I got to re- resurrect something out of this. And, um, but the, 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 the Denver, you know, it just didn't marry well. The, the Denver fans were not interested in the WHA team at all. And I think Mullenix had no interest in staying in Denver. He was not based in Denver to begin with. So you had a situation where the, people were probably distrustful of the team as well as feeling kind of burned, burned by having the NHL come and then not come uh, as they had promised. So that's the one case where uh, it was probably really poorly handled. The team was not supported. They, they were lucky to draw a couple thousand a game and um, Mullenix just wanted out as soon as he could. And so uh yeah, I'm sure it didn't help when the Rockies came. You know, it didn't help the situation for the Rockies. I, I wouldn't say that they failed for the same reason, um, but clearly we've seen, you know, since 95 when the Avalanche, ironically the Quebec Nordiques, um, have set uh, set roots in the town that they've become very successful. So you, you, you can't really blame – I wouldn't blame the Denver fans of 75 for ignoring the Spurs either. It was just not a well-put-together uh, organization or or action. All right, a couple, a couple of last questions here, uh, and mm-hmm. some of these sort of realm and uh, d- delve into sort of the more opinion, and, and obviously yours is an educated one because of all the depth of the research that you've done over the years, whether whether you choose to admit it or not, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You accumulated a whole lot of, uh, of wisdom uh, in that process, although it may not seem like wisdom, I'm sure, sometimes. Um, I, I guess the, the uh, one sort of uh, wrap-up question is, of the people that you've interfaced with over the years, as you published now going on, it's now 11th edition of this book and, and now supplemented with it, with another book, a fact book. I'll let you talk about that in a second. Um, what, wh- how can you categorize the, the conversations, the memories? Uh, would you say that they're bitter? Are they uh, happy and nostalgic? Are they somewhere in between? How would you sort of, uh, the people you know, that you've, you've touched, I guess, by, you know, creating literally the go-to resource for this, this league that only lasted for a handful of years in the seventies. I would say um, more nostalgic these days. Okay. Um, people, people kind of but, not, not remembering the the tough and rocky times and, and paychecks bouncing and that stuff, huh? Sure. You know, you might, you know, if I had maybe interviewed somebody in a, a Cincinnati Stingers fan in 1979, I might've gotten a different answer. Well, that's, uh, that's actually a very interesting point. Like the Stingers, I mean, I think that's probably one of the biggest sort of question marks out of this, right? I mean, they, they were one of the stronger teams, and, and they yeah. didn't make a cut, right, for various reasons. They had the money. Um, they had the ownership. They had the DeWitts. Um, I, thought, I can believe Bill DeWitt uh, Jr. owns the St. Louis Cardinals of Major League Baseball. Um, that, that was a well-run, well-run team. They just, it was, I think if they had, had a few more years to get a little more of a foothold, they would have done very well. Um, but I would say that most people I've talked to have, are, have been appreciative and nostalgic. Uh, can't really recall a case where somebody, you know, was upset or, or still holding grudges after so many years. Um, I, I have no doubt that it's, uh, it's some when their teams went defunct. And I'm sure that, that, that feeling probably stayed with these fans for many years. But, you know, by this time, it's been 30, 40 years since, since these events happened. So, you know, I think they look back and say, you know, it was a good run. I was younger. I enjoyed the team. You know, I'll take what I can get in that case. The players uh, themselves, I, I've, I've talked to a few players over the years, and every single one of them has just been extremely friendly and, 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 and supportive of the book and just nothing but fond memories. And, and I want to give one example. is Gordy Gallant, who was the uh, main enforcer for the uh, uh, Fighting Saints. You probably remember him. And I talked to him back in 99 at the uh, WHA reunion. And he just, he was just such a swell guy. He, he all smiles. And all he had was nice things to say about his opponents, all the guys he fought. If I brought up an old, one of his adversaries, he said, Oh, what a great guy, you know, dear friend, you know, just a, just a nothing but fond memories. And, and that really made an impression on me. You know, these guys knew that they experienced something special um, at the time. And so it's, it, Every single interview that I've done or just casual conversation with, with these old players has been very enjoyable. 
So you're up to 11 editions now. Um, yeah. The original book uh, in my hot little hands here had, if I uh-huh. remember correct, 438 pages of goodness. Now you're up to, uh, you're pushing on 535, almost 550 yes. pages now. Um, what can what can fans uh, find uh, in this book? What, what are they going to get when, when they order it early and often, as we'll be promoting during the course of this episode? <laughs> Um, yeah. What, what do they expect, right? Yeah. Um, well, I hope they find as much information as they want to find on the WHA in one place. In the big book, um, I try to give statistics to the point of distraction. You know, you want to know how many power play goals a team, a guy scored, it's there for the most part. I'm still piecing together some cases. Uh, splits, uh, game, uh, day-to-day game day by day game line scores. That's, that's one of the relatively new additions to the book. Uh, uh, draft lists that are more complete. Uh, in fact, in the most recent edition, I was able to flesh out some of the, uh, like the 79 expansion draft. Um, you know, some of the kind of arcane things like the, 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 uh, the referees and the linesmen, you know, I have a page for them. Uh, the media people who, who called the games. You know, you were talking about John Sterling a little while ago. Well, Jerry Truppiano, I'm sure a lot of Boston Red Sox fans know, uh, he, he called the Houston Arrows back in the 70s. Uh, so a lot of guys got their start in, in media in the WHA. Yeah, we, we tried to get um, Eli Gold, uh, Birmingham Bulls, Birmingham, uh, yep. and uh, he politely declined. I, I don't know if he was uh, necessarily uh, – he wants to go back and remember one of his first mm. pro gigs, uh, moving all the way from New York down south to to call WHA games. Who knows why? But uh, but yeah, there's a lot of great little stories like that, huh? So and so I try. I, I realize the the big book is probably more for the completists. It's it's going to have all the players. It's going to have the uh, the game by game line scores down to the periods uh, who scored the goals, shots on goal, goaltenders, things like that. It's going to have complete player statistics, uh, the game by game results. Uh, splits. Um, so really, I tr- that's where I try to throw all the stats together. Um, is it complete? No, it's probably about 99% complete. There's still a few areas where the information is just, I haven't found it yet. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if people go to bed worrying about how many power play goals, you know, the 79 Birmingham Bulls score, but, you know, hopefully I can find that information for somebody someday. Um, but the, the smaller book, it was meant to be more of a, a, a lower price kind of thumbnail. You know, I realize not everybody cares about all the arcane stats, but they want to have something there that has the main figures. And that's what, that's the, where the fact book comes in. Uh, I put that out, I want to say about 10 years ago now. And that was more meant to be, well, obviously smaller in size, smaller in price. And, so, for example, it might list the player statistics, but only the main statistics, goals, assists, points, penalty minutes. Um, and for a lot of people, that's probably good enough. Uh, I, try, I, I try to have the main narrative pieces in there um, so that you, if you buy the book, the smaller book, you at least have, uh, you know, you get, you get the main uh, stories of the WHA. The bigger book clearly will go into a little more depth. Um, but, you know, I leave the choice up to the buyer. I always suggest people buy, buy, eat, buy both books. In fact, buy a couple because you want one for, say, you know, while on the road and one for the home. Um, they make great gifts. <laughs> um, but, you know, in all seriousness, I'm, I'm, I'm just extremely appreciative of all the fans who purchased my book over the years. How many more um, revisions do you think you have in you? And I guess part of that question is, what uh, what pieces of the puzzle have you, for whatever reasons, not been able to find and 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 fit into the uh, the overall box uh, of goodness that you've created over the years? There, I, I honestly don't. I don't know how many more revisions. I, I, I do them as I see fit. There are still some player statistics that just haven't been resolved to my satisfaction. Um, and I'm thinking off the top of my head, but some some of the early seasons and then. And then some of the later, uh, the mid years, like 76, 77, there's a lot of statistics that are still kind of contradictory. And so if you, there will be some blanks in there. I simply don't have the figures. I would love to somehow resolve all those remaining issues. And it's always been my dream to get my hands on the official game sheets. I don't know where they are housed or if they're even in existence anymore, but it would be great if I could get um, 
every single game sheet from the the WHA and literally rebuild the statistics in a massive database. Um, I think that would be something really special. Right now, it's kind of in static form. It's in the book, and I have it, you know, uh, in Excel. But you know, something a little more uh, manipulate where it can be manipulated easier. Uh, that would be kind of my big dream. But as far as the books are concerned, honestly, I don't know. I, I, I don't have any plans at the moment to put out a 12th edition, uh, but you never know. Something might come down the pike where I just get a lot of really good information, and who knows. Uh, but as of this very moment, I don't have any set plans. And I guess give me a sense of sort of uh, the the level of satisfaction that comes out of all this, because, you know, as we speak and record this episode uh, in late February, um, where uh, we see uh, some of the NHL franchises uh, actually a bunch through the uh, the uh, the auspices of Adidas uh, doing retro throwback Mm -hmm. uh, remix kind of a jersey kind of uh, 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 takes. Right. Uh, The the the. Uh, Carolina Hurricanes had a, a gorgeous look of the uh, their former uh, uh, place mm-hmm. locale, part of the WHA story with the Hartford, uh, formerly New England Whalers uh, stuff. Yes. Uh, the Nordiques uh, making a uh, a nice uh, appearance in uh, the form of the Colorado um, uh, Avalanche, I think. Right uh, yes. uh, with with their so, I'm just really curious as to what your thoughts are on. Uh, the legacy and the heritage and, and where, and we ask this of a lot of our guests, where, where do you think the uh, official histories and celebrations for these teams should live? Right. Um, some of them are pretty obvious and straightforward, right? I mean, obviously Hartford did become Carolina and yeah, uh-huh. and frankly, I talked to people who are still very big Hartford Whalers fans and, and they, they can't accept the fact that Carolina <laughs> under their new ownership is making a cash grab is the way they describe it. Right. right. Uh, instead of remembering the heritage, cause it's only relatively new that they sort of remembered that Hartford, yes. but, but, but there are also teams that don't exist anymore like the Philadelphia Blazers. I mean, do, 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 or the Vancouver Blazers. I mean, d- does, do the flyers or, or the Canucks uh, have a, have a, a, a shot, a, a, a rational uh, business in, having a throwback night because for a couple of years fans of pro hockey in those cities may have gone to some of their games or, or like, what do you yeah. sort of see all that sort of thing? Or is it just kind of out there in the ether and they don't really live on anywhere or should it? It's hard to say, um, you know, those teams were only around for a couple of seasons and it's been almost 50 years now. So they'd be focusing to a very narrow uh, demographic at that point. Now, there are a lot of fans who are much younger who have probably read about the old Blazers or the Cowboys um, and who would probably be interested. I I think they could probably leverage this to some extent today with, with, you know, the ease of the Internet and Amazon and buying things online where they could sell. I don't know who would uh, govern this, but, you know, like try to promote like like a T-shirt for the old Vancouver Blazers. But, you know, as to where these, these, these legacies live, you know, I, I would like to see a little more formal. For example, I would like to see, say, the Phoenix Roadrunners have some sort of uh, recognition in, in Phoenix, you know, at, at the, at the uh, jobbing.com arena or whatever they call it these days. Um, I, I don't like it when the teams just simply ignore any WHA history um, because it is important to recognize that these teams – did exist. You know, I don't, I, I think that, you know, you don't have to have, you don't have to go all out, but to at least, you know, show the fans, Hey, back in the seventies, there was a team here called the Blazers and, you know, here was a couple interesting players that played for them and they are part of hockey history. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's kind of a difficult question to answer. I, I think when you said it, they're out in the ether somewhere, I think that's probably the best answer. I think uh, it's been a long time, long enough time now that the people who remember it firsthand are going to be in there late fifties probably. And uh, anybody younger than that is just going to be history to them. And, um, you know, I, I, I think in, in some of the teams like the Whalers, you know, of course they existed in the NHL for a long time afterwards, you know, and even the Nordiques, um, I think those teams 
their legacy should live on through the current team somehow. And I don't have an answer to that. And I certainly don't want to offend a Whalers fan in Hartford by saying somehow the, the Carolina team is supposed to handle this. Um, I, 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 I don't have a good answer to that. Yeah, it, that, that one's a particularly raw one because even yeah. before the the new ownership or the relatively new ownership, the Hurricanes kind of, you know, recognized that they had this to mine, shall we say. Well, uh, I, I give them points for at least observing the sure. team originated in Hartford. Which is, right, which is more, and, you know, it, 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 we talk about this, like, say, in, in Minnesota, right, with the Wild, right, you know, mm-hmm. the North Stars, right? Uh, even though the North Stars diaspora is – you know, mostly in Dallas now, right? When the team actually right. moved, some of it went to San Jose, actually. It's a very arcane sort of uh, family tree there. But, you know, what about the Fighting Saints, right? I mean, exactly. uh, they didn't go anywhere per se, right? But, but you know, they're they, look, the logo, uh, the story, mm-hmm. uh, the, they, they lived up to their namesake uh, on more than a few evenings of, of, uh, of hockey excitement, right? Um, uh, you know, it's, and frankly, don't underestimate, I guess, today's modern day, uh, pro sports uh, conglomerate, right? I mean, where there's mm-hmm. a logo, there's there's money to be made, if you will. Exactly. And, I, I think in the case of Minnesota, yeah. I think I think they could, if the Wild could somehow uh, channel some of that old fighting saint uh, imagery, that might actually work. Uh, that was a team that was very well well supported, at least by the fans in in St. Paul, um, and you know. It, they, they had the money. Now, one thing you'll notice that the, the, the Wild this year, their third jerseys are using the old yellow and green from the North Stars. Well, maybe they could kind of do something with the blue and gold from the Fighting Saints in a future season. Say, for example, in 2022, which would be the 50th anniversary of the founding of the league. Something like that would be kind of cool. So it would be interesting to see if the, if the Calgary Flames want to you know, wear the old cowboy uh, tops for a game or two. Um, maybe have a, couple, a series with Edmonton going, you know, with, where Edmonton's wearing his old uniform tops from the early 70s. These kind of things actually, I think, would work out well. I, I don't think the NHL has anything to worry about anymore <laughs> about the WHA. I know that there was a lot of hard feelings um, between the two leagues, especially even after the merger. Um, but at this point, I think it's purely for historical sake, and I think a lot of fans would be, would be appreciative. And I don't, I, you know, here's the thing. I don't think there's a, a, a statute of limitations on this stuff, right? I mean, I, right. If, if you if you look at what Major League Baseball finally and way yes. overdue did last year by uh, uh, fully uh, incorporating uh, the major leagues of the Negro Leagues. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm into, happy to hear that. Right. I, I, but I, I think that, frankly, should send a signal to everybody, right? I, yep. Whether it's halls of fame, like in, in, in the world of soccer, right? Where is the MISL in the, in the U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame, for example, right? Exactly. The major Indoor Soccer League was, frankly, was pro soccer in, in a, b- a bunch of the 1980s. Mm-hmm. And arguably without it, we wouldn't even have the chance or hint of having a Major League Soccer that we exactly. do today. I mean, well, all, there, there's lots of these stories. And hockey is, is, is not immune from, from, shall we say, making the story whole. And, and, well, I'll give you an example. Yeah, go ahead. I'll give, you an ex- I'll give you an example. The, the NBA has for years counted player statistics from the ABA in the player's career stats. Um, nobody pretends that Julius Irving showed up one day in 76 with the 76ers. Uh, everybody knew he had had his career start back in the ABA with what, Virginia and then New York. Same for the uh, WHA. You know, people who say that Gretzky first scored his first NHL goal against Vancouver or first goal against Vancouver in 79 are simply wrong. Uh, he had a full season in the WHA, and it was a legitimate season. That, and that last year, the WHA was, I believe, on par with the NHL. You know, maybe not with Montreal or Boston at the time, but with the rest of the NHL. I do think that the NHL should start counting the WHA statistics in the, in the, in the overall player stats. I think guys like Andre Lacroix should be considered for the Hall of Fame. I think well, a player, a particular player that I sh- think should be in the Hall of Fame is Jean-Claude Tremblay, who played for the Nordiques. Even if you took out his Nordiques years and just took him what he did with Montreal back in the 60s and 70s, early 70s, he'd probably be Hall worthy. Um, I think it's unfortunate. I think some of these players, when they went to the WHA, it's almost like they fell off the face of the earth and they just got forgotten about. And I, I'd like to see some, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, resurrection of some of these players just. For, for today's recognition, they, they played in a legitimate major league. 
and, and anybody who wants to say that the NHL was better, well, I'm going to say there was no team in the WHA as bad as the old Washington Capitals or the Kansas City Scouts or the California Golden Seals. You know, there may have been some bad teams in the WHA, but they didn't have the disparity that the NHL had. Well, you've just hit the nail on the head when it comes to why I we continue to chug along on this little show because, you know, and it's times every sport and uh, and and whatever out there. And, you know, some of it's just it's whimsical. Some of it is curious. Some of it is wistful. Some of it uh, brings up some unfortunate memories and, and, you know, hopes dashed and all that kind of stuff. But but in the aggregate. Right. Uh, and, and hockey is in, you know, certainly a great example of all this is Mm -hmm. this is part of the story, right? The story of professional hockey certainly includes the minor leagues to a certain Mm -hmm. extent, but at least in the, in the 1970s, this was, yeah, you could make the argument that the NHL would not be the juggernaut. Well, juggernaut, it's certainly part of the bigger sports ecosystem for sure right yes. we can argue about how but you know a selling a, a, a almost 600 million dollars expansion franchise in seattle right that doesn't mm-hmm. happen by, by chance mm-hmm. and and the wha was a a major uh catalyst shall we say in, yes. in in creating what is now you know the north american um you know a, a top tier league in the world right yes. uh in, in the sport of hockey right so to neglect mm-hmm. or forget these WHA contributions, right? I, I don't think, with all due respect, I don't think that this this work goes for naught. I, I think they're it's important um, to to keep not only the the memories and the statistics mm-hmm. alive, but to keep the um, the information as uh, uh, as pristine and accurate as possible because yes. it's all part of it, right? And as long yeah. as certain people are not in the, uh, the the Hockey Hall of Fame, or as long as those statistics are not equalized uh, with the NHL and, and all those kinds of things. I mean, that, that, frankly, that stuff matters. And, and look, I'll give you put it even more human terms, right? You mentioned the ABA sure. and the NBA. Um, you know, th- there are a bunch, I would say a few dozen uh, players in the, from the old ABA that um, I think very rightly so feel that the NBA at least owes them a little something in terms of whether it's a pension or health insurance or, or some of those things, uh, that that sort of occurred during the merger. There there are some players yeah, yeah. who are, you know, n- not doing all that well, and they are near the end of their lives, unfortunately. And yes. and 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 the NBA has kind of you know left them kind of hanging. And there are certainly some right things to do there by those players who absolutely have some role in the fabric of the history of the NBA for mm-hmm. sure. So I yes. sorry, I get descending soapbox, but I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm tr- it's a it's a long way way of saying. This stuff, while you feel like you may not have another rev- revision in you, uh, is not only a labor of love, but frankly, it's it's a labor of labor, <laughs> literally yes. and figuratively, and it's important. I mean, it's important to the lives and the history of these sports, I think. And, and I agree, and I do think that it should be recognized. I think every player who played has had a, a part, whether big or small, in what hockey is today. Um, there are a lot of guys that put in a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears got paid relatively little, although at the time it was probably pretty decent, but still, in, term, in terms of today's money, relatively little. Yet, the, I don't think they, I agree with you. I don't think the NHL would be where it is with, had it not for the WHA coming along and basically making the NHL uncomfortable. Um, with the WHA and all these new teams, you had to get creative. Uh, it was the WHA that went looking for players from Europe. Um, you know, the NHL had a few Europeans, but it was the WHA who said, come on over, we need players. Uh, it was the WHA who started scouting the United States, college hockey, uh, high school hockey players, Minnesota and, and, the, and the original, uh, when the Whalers were based in Boston. Um, so it forced people to think outside the box. And I think that ultimately had a positive impact on hockey in general and the NHL specifically after the merger. So I think the NHL owes some acknowledgement to the WHA. Um, again, you don't have to love them, but the NHL would not be the, where it is today had it not been for the WHA. I don't think there would be an Edmonton Oilers right now. There might be a team in Edmonton. Maybe they would have been an expansion team in 85. Who knows? But uh, I think it was important to recognize that these, the, the league came on when it did. It, it, it was not a good time for hockey in general, but ultimately the NHL – through the efforts of the WHA, became a stronger league as a result. 
All right. Here's your chance to formally promote. We'll be doing it before and okay, after, sure. after the, the interview and stuff. But um, give us the, the full names of the books and where you uh, encourage our listeners to buy them. And uh, then maybe if you have any other projects in mind along well, the lines that you may be rattling around your brain or are you done? Um, well, the, full, the first book is called the, uh, I think I've shortened it in recent years. It's just the Complete World Hockey Association, 11th edition. And and the smaller one's called the World Hockey Association Fact Book. And it's in its second edition. Uh, both of them are available on the uh, uh, Amazon. Um, and I actually have a kind of a page in development. It's under my own name for now, surgeon.net slash WHA slash home HTML. So it's not the best address, but uh, it's a page that I'm developing where I'm putting all the information from the book into web form. Um, so it's if you look at it, it's pretty bare bones for now, but I encourage people to take a peek. And uh, you can always go to my my personal web page, surgeon.net, and I have links to these places. So that's that, that's my promotion. Um, one last thing before we go is I, I would like to, again, express my gratitude to every single person who purchased a book in the last 26 years and every single person who has been supportive in, in my efforts uh, you know, people who sent me maybe one bit of information, people who sent me a lot of information, and also people who su- supported me outside the hockey world. And I want to give su- uh, a shout out to my wife, Beth, who has been extremely supportive of this project over the years. Well, look, it, it, it's uh, it's uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving. And, and again, I, having a uh, having had this uh, original uh, version in my uh, library since. Uh, since it first came out in the uh, mid 1990s, um, uh-huh. it's uh, it's it's great to know that you're still at it, and uh, that there are uh, even more revisions. And I think there are plenty of fans out there who um, not only need to know that uh, this book's existence that they don't already, well, uh, I pre- but recognizes the comprehensiveness of it, which is uh, truly one of a kind and and valuable. At that, well, I appreciate that very much. Um, I appreciate this. Uh, uh, off, uh, opportunity to speak with you and to speak to a larger audience, and it's been quite fun. It's been it's been 25 years of fun. It, it actually has been a hobby that I've enjoyed quite a bit, and I still enjoy doing it for the pure fun of it. Um, it I, I don't think I'll ever make actual money from it. Whatever I make usually just goes right right back into the, the the project, but I do it for the enjoyment of it, and I actually am appreciative of. Uh, being able to help hockey history in one small way, you know, just kind of keep the WHA alive and, and on people's radar. You know, it, it has been almost 50 years since they were founded and a little over 40 since it went out of business. So I think it's important to still keep this lead in people in, in, the, in the awareness of hockey fans. All right, our thanks to Scott. Tremendous conversation, even more tremendous book. Actually, books. And those books are, let's promote them, shall we? The Complete World Hockey Association, 11th edition by Scott Surgeon. Uh, It's 536 pages of WHA, statistical and more so goodness. The other book is the World Hockey Association Fact Book, 2nd edition, also by our pal Scott Surgeon. 390 pages, a little bit smaller, a little bit more portable for all those uh, candid conversations about the WHA when you're on the road. Both of those books uh, can be most easily found, certainly on Amazon, but if you go to our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com, search up this episode, number 204 with Scott Surgent, and just click on the convenient links. We'll get a couple of shekels of love, and uh, you'll be whisked away to Amazon and uh, easy peasy. Uh, It couldn't be uh, more simple to do so great book. Uh, You can also go to Scott's uh, website at surgent.net. That's S-U-R-G-E-N-T dot net slash W-H-A. And you'll see the books there as well. Uh, And you'll even find a couple of links. You'll see also also the stuff that's in it. But a couple of links that'll show you a couple of uh, PDF uh, digital pages that actually shows you uh, specifically just how rich and detailed this stuff is. Uh, Excellent books, both both essential for your uh, 
your uh, reference shelves. And please, by all means, buy them early and often. Uh, they are well worth uh, the price tag and they're reasonably priced. I can assure you that. Uh, what else? Uh, if you want to follow us again, goodseatstillavailable.com, best place to do that. Uh, please, please, please uh, subscribe to us in your podcast feeds. Uh, make sure if you uh, like the show, uh, to rate and review us wherever you do that. Uh, if you want to forward the show through your podcast app, all those things help our uh, our algorithms uh, get smarter and uh, and push the show to more people like you. So we have uh, increased and uh, tremendous listenership uh, beyond what we've got today. And we, we appreciate that to no end. Uh, if you want to send us some email, please do so. We're at hello at goodseatstillavailable.com. Uh, you want to follow us on uh, social media, please do that too. We're on Facebook at, uh, just search us up. You'll find us a good seat still available. A little page devoted to us there. On Instagram, you'll find us at good seats still available. And on Twitter, you will find us at good seats still. Uh, there is a weekly email newsletter you can sign up for uh, as well. Just find us a little tab there on our website. And uh, of course, our thanks to the great Dr. Jerry Payne. Uh, for all of his uh, twiddling of knobs and 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 pushing of buttons this week, uh, we cannot do this show without his production uh, help, uh, of course. And uh, thank you. We cannot do the show without you either, you listener there out there. Uh, we appreciate you doing so. Thanks for listening, of course. And uh, we'll see you next week with something else, something good, I hope, and something you'll enjoy. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Bye.